now you know in the community in policies like hey like this is one thing i know that community needs and i'm going to keep elevating that idea intervention in the circles that i'm in out there in the community if somebody asks me hey like what's a good idea what should we be doing i know exactly what to say and that kind of clarity also can come if you're able to engage directly with the community in that way how do we become more effective healers who provide culturally competent patient care that respects the cultural richness of the diverse communities we serve? Let's talk all about it with family physician, community organizer, and podcaster Raj Sundar right here on episode 412 of The Nurse Keith Show. Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. This podcast is always about you and your personal professional development, your career, and the healthcare system writ large. And I'm here to share education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, medicine, nursing, entrepreneurship, and beyond. I love having you along for the ride, and I thank you from the bottom of my nurse podcaster's heart for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. And guess what? You can now get CEUs from listening to podcasts. That's right, at rnegade.pro, rnegade.pro. They're building a library of nursing podcasts offering continuing education because look, you're listening anyway, so you might as well earn some credits. So head over to rnegade.pro, log into the portal, choose me or any other content creator and get CEs for listening. And if you'd like to help other people find the show, you can leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Google, Amazon, or Spotify, and consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Nurse Keith. I appreciate you all so much. You can head over to nursekeith.com to find the show notes for this episode, or of course, they'll be in the show notes of any app where you happen to be listening. And like I said, we are here with Raj Sundar. He's a physician, community organizer, and podcaster from the Seattle area. And Raj, it's so exciting always to interview a fellow podcaster. And one of the first questions I want to ask you is, what does cultural competency mean to you? How do you describe it? Yeah, thanks for having me, Keith. And it's such a good question to start off this conversation with. And I want to actually ask you what you've learned about cultural competency, because I like to start there to expand the definition of it and look we'll at it from a different perspective. And I'm curious what you learned or what you understand of it so far. It doesn't have to be a formal definition. Yeah, that's um, I love how you're turning it around. That's great. So back in nursing school, like mid-90s, we had textbooks on cultural competency. They talked about it quite a bit. So kudos to them, you know, for talking about it back. That was quite a few years ago, you know. Um, I see cultural competency as, gosh, as the ability to recognize and honor what you perceive to be the culture of the person in front of you or group in front of you, what have you, um, whether it's their, their folk practices, their mores, their food, the way in which they look at their bodies and their health, or the way they, they, they approach nutrition or religion or their, their gender identification, you know, I feel like cultural competency can have a really broad and deep definition and it can encompass almost any part of a person's life. And just because a person's a member of one particular cultural like ethnic group, and I'm putting big quotes around ethnic group, doesn't mean they even practice the things that you think they do or that a textbook told you they do. So without knowing or asking, I mean, how much can you truly know other than what you think you know? Keith, that was beautiful. It feels like you've gotten and you have an enlightened version of uh, cultural competence. I'll say that because there's still a sense with cultural competence that is oversimplified, right? You talked about so many facets of that that 
is beautiful, right? About honoring people's cultures, traditions, respecting their bodies. And you also brought in this idea of humility. People sometimes use the word cultural humility about, mm. hey, it's not everybody that believes these certain values from country or ethnicity. I still need to be open to this individual in front of me and look at my own beliefs and values that I'm bringing in. It's not just about this other person, but like, what about me? I'm living in America, you know, I'm in Washington state. I have these beliefs about health and healthcare because of my education, in Western medicine. So really acknowledging that part of it is important with the humility. And I'll add that facet to that too. But why I asked you that question is a lot of people actually only get a brief introduction to cultural competence and then never revisit it because the idea of cultural competence, at least when it was originated, was the idea that we're going to study people different than us so we can understand their values and beliefs. And that's just like a layman's definition. You know, there's formal definitions out there. But the problem with how it was created and sometimes how it still remains, uh, how it's still used today is... One, there's this idea of like, I'm the normal person and all these people are different and exotic, right? And I'm studying them. So it inherently may, like dehumanizes some people. The second is it can oversimplify entire countries and stereotype them. Not always. And you had that nuanced definition, which, I, which is why I called that out for you. Because if you look at cultural competence articles or textbooks, it's like, Cambodia. These mm. are the, th the three things people believe and the things they wear. <laughs> and all of a sudden, people are like, check, I understood them. So next time I see them, I feel ready <laughs> because I know they believe these things, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and you know what? You have an amazing podcast called Healthcare for Humans. And you have, you have, you know, a small number of episodes out, fewer than 20 or around, you're getting to around 20. And I listened to quite a few episodes and maybe part of my cultural competence definition, maybe I cheated because I listened to your podcast, <laughs> but you have a two part, um, two episodes on Chinese communities and you had this awesome guest who kind of broke it down and you all, I, what I like about your show is you dive deep into the history of that country and culture, you know, you go way, way back and some people might think like, this is a healthcare podcast. Like, why are you talking about like the history of, you know, China in the 19th century, but it's important. And I learned a bunch of things about Chinese culture and, you know, the, the ethnic um, groups within, within that Chinese, you know, larger umbrella. And so your podcast really approaches, you know, I've listened to one of your episodes about Indian culture you know, because your your family's from India, so you're approaching it from that direction. And I'm wondering, like, I mentioned nursing school, where in my school we had textbooks about it, we talked about it, we had a class on it. What happens in medical school? Because you're a doctor, I'm just curious. What did you experience? It's kind of similar, right? There's a module or a textbook chapter on a community, but that's it. And we don't revisit it again. Like I go through a residency, uh, you know, some people go through fellowships. We focus exclusively on medicine. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what we do, right? Body systems and organs. Yeah. And we say, hey, we've already learned that there's this thing called culture. It's important. And you kind of know about it. That's enough. But I feel like your audience and you know, like when we're actually delivering care, mm -hmm. sometimes the most important part is actually the person. <laughs> Right? It seems yeah. so obvious to say it, but we forget the person and just focus on the illness so much. And the person themselves holds so many identities, right? And one is cultural, uh, another is just them as an individual, another is like their local community. There's just, there's so many layers to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But personally, as you brought up, all I knew was this medical textbook or some written articles. And I felt like I wasn't being the doctor that I wanted to be or the caregiver or clinician, you can use whatever word. This person is in front of me wanting to be cared for, has some questions, and there was this gap between us because I could not communicate the way I wanted to. I didn't understand them in all the ways they wanted to be understood. 
and our time of encounter and the time we have with each other was always so short that either patients didn't want to have the burden of explaining their entire history, like immigration history and country, or like they didn't, that's not what they wanted to spend time on because they have this pain or problem. They came to me and this is like the 15 minutes they get, they waited for two minutes, I mean, two weeks. Uh, so we have to like get through this. And I felt like I had to learn more somehow. And I need to do it in a way that was centering the community, right? Like outside of this textbook, can I actually directly talk to the community mm -hmm. and ask them what it means to care for them? And that captures nuances um, and the complexity around culture so much more than something written. And it's been so valuable and rewarding for me too. Yeah. And I think the podcast is really important on many, many levels. And going back to this nursing school, medical school thing for a second, you mm -hmm. know, one thing we always realize is that, you know, nursing schools teach certain things because those are the things that are going to be on the NCLEX, the board. So they'll only teach topics pretty much that are included in the nursing boards. So they do include questions on cultural competence within the nursing board. So I think that forces school's hand a little bit. And I'm assuming that happens with the MCATs as well, or that there's some attention paid maybe to cultural competence within the, the testing area of medicine and medical training, or no? Um, and it's evolved a bit. It's evolved. But definitely not that nuanced. Okay. Right. And I sometimes they were racist questions. Like, oh dear. Well, you know what I mean? Like, only black, it's like if they say a 28 year old African American, that means we should think of these 10 diseases. Right. Oh, like sickle that cell kind anemia, of. Yeah, exactly. Diabetes, right. Hypertension. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that's where your and, differential uh, starts. <laughs> yeah. And so that kind of thinking existed. It's evolved. I don't want to undermine medical education. I think it's grown. Yeah. But I think cultural competency is in that way. They kind of nod to it. They're a little, it's required a little bit, but not to, not in the depth and the complexity that I feel like I needed to know to care for my oh, patients and I see. people, you know? I see. Okay. So you mentioned something about, um, oh, just a few minutes ago, you said they've waited two weeks. This is their 15 minutes they've got with me. So here's my question for you. And mm -hmm. it's just a curiosity, you know, these are the days of the 15 minute visit. So whether you're a mm -hmm. specialist or a generalist, 15 minutes is sort of the norm in many practices, right? Where yeah. you might get 25 for a complex visit, maybe if you're lucky, depending where you work. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a well-meaning clinician and you know I want to be culturally competent, I want to take a full history, I really want to know where this family or this person's coming from, how do I do that in the context of these lightning fast visits? Is it possible? Yeah. That's something that I ask myself every day. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But I'll say I want to separate out the bigger system structures, things that could be improved to care for the people we want. Right. Same for nursing. You know, you all are under different pressures and caring for in the hospital or, you know, I have nurse in the clinic. They're also kind of crunched for time. So this time factor is a problem that ideally in a better world, we would have more time to just care for the people in front of us and get them what they need. But the second part I'm saying is like, given what's true in our reality, like how can I be better? And your question speaks to that of like, these visits are lightning fast. Like, how are we going to incorporate all these things that you're talking about, Raj? <laughs> like, uh, people's history, culture, when already there's not enough time to sometimes do the, the one thing that they came in for. Mm -hmm. I will say, more than anything, it's allowed me to ask better questions. And not diminish somebody's humanity or reality because I know nothing about them. Oh. I can use two examples. The one that I think I may have shared with you, right? It was like a moment of joy that was kind of unexpected for me because it was right after New Year's. It was the second week of New Year's or something. And, you know, like everybody keeps saying Happy New Year because we don't know when to stop saying it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but what I, what I knew was that with the Ethiopian community, the calendar was different. Their holidays were different. 
I didn't know the exact same ones. I didn't know when the dates were, but I knew their Christmas was during that time rather than New Year's and it wasn't the New Year's. So we were just starting the visit um, and we were talking about something and I brought up, hey, like, how was Christmas for you, right? And they were surprised because everybody else has been talking about New Year's and I actually asked them the question that they didn't think anybody would ask them what mm -hmm. they're actually celebrating. And, you know, they weren't going to go around, hey, like, it's not New Year's, it's actually Christmas for us, like, stop asking us that. But he, like, kind of lit up and explained to me all the things that they were doing. Um, and it was a moment of connection that I felt like didn't exist before that, because he finally felt like, even though I'm not from the community, I don't look exactly like them, that I knew some things about them that I, they could share and maybe we could connect at that level mm. because I had a different starting point and foundation about, about their community. So part of it in that story, and that's a really nice heartwarming story is that you first, you have the awareness, right? The consciousness to even consider that maybe what they do might be somewhat different than everybody else, right? Or over from a lot of people. And then you have the presence of mind to take 60 or 90 seconds to engage in that conversation, even though you know you only have about 15 minutes. Yeah. But so what happens to the quality of the visit and the quality of your connection as a healer, as a clinician with that family or couple or individual when you've gone out of your way to try to connect with them on that other level? So what have you witnessed that makes that connection not much better. Yeah. It's about trust, right? Mm -hmm. I think more and more we're acknowledging there's a crisis of trust mm. with the healthcare system yeah. through the pandemic, through people not wanting to be vaccinated, through people dying in certain communities more than others. So many things that we could talk about here, but an underlying issue was communities didn't trust healthcare systems. And at the micro level, sometimes individuals don't trust clinicians. And I felt like those moments opened up some more trust or increased it a little bit. And trust is a little elusive because you have to keep building on it and you have to keep showing up in the right way. So it's not that all of a sudden the patient trusts me for everything, mm -hmm. but now they've opened up a little bit and I can build on that and really think about like, how do I keep showing up for them? How do I make sure I show them my competence to solve the problems they need? How do I show them that we're in this together and I want to care for them? And it just allows me to do that better. And I have another example, which is going to be, I think, also demonstrate this idea of trust Great. and maybe even take less time than 60 seconds. Take your time. And, and, well, 60 seconds, as you noted, about how we're taking this extra time to build trust um, out of this short visit. But sometimes we're doing things that's actively actually building mistrust when if you just change that behavior, um, you can connect with patients better without losing any time in the visit. An example that I use that is often salient for people is the Native Hawaiian community. Because when the Native Hawaiian community goes to healthcare systems, visits, gets in the hospital, so many people see or notice that they're from Hawaii and the first thing they want to bring up is how they went on vacation for at Hawaii, right? And being like, hey, like, I went to this place. Do you know that place? Like, where are you mm -hmm. from? And I'll say no one's, no one. Like, most people aren't intentionally trying to cause harm, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to connect. They're trying to build rapport. And for some patients, that's probably okay. Mm -hmm. But with this culture work that came out so explicitly in the Native Hawaiian episode was, that's the exact opposite thing that you should be saying to some folks because Hawaii has become so expensive, so expensive to live because of tourism. So Native Hawaiians had to leave their homeland and come to a different state. Mm -hmm. And now they can't even go back and visit their family because it's so expensive because of tourism. And you're going to talk about that one thing that's caused them trauma and land displacement and feel like that's going to build connection. And now they have to share their vulnerabilities, trust that you have their best interest in heart, mm -hmm. and then listen to your recommendations. And that's a hard place to start with, right? And I and then I follow up saying, hey, this does not mean you can never tell anybody you went to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. The idea is that 
you ask, right? You say, hey, like, are you like, um, are you from Hawaii? If so, like, have you been back home lately, recently? And then that could be a different starting point rather than assuming and talking about yourself as a way to build rapport. I think that's that's a humble place to start. So Raj, I'm really curious. We've talked about cultural competence and there's this concept of cultural safety. And I think I know what it means, but I'm really curious how that plays out in your practice and how you explain what that safety means. Yeah, I, you know, we've talked about cultural competence a little bit and humility, cultural humility, where you're reflecting on your own values and beliefs. And there's this other concept out there called cultural safety. It was originally highlighted and amplified by Maori nurses in New Zealand, which is the indigenous population there, when they were figuring out how can they receive safe care within this healthcare system. And cultural safety was a term they used to highlight the power differences. Power differences mm-hmm. meaning like each of us individuals hold power, right? And when we're in a clinical environment, whether it's in the hospital, clinic, where we're interacting, the care provider, caregiver has power and the person who's sick and vulnerable has less power because they're really dependent on you at the individual level. And then at a broader level, like bigger level, if you step back as a community level, there's power differences too. With the indigenous community, there's so much background there, right? If you're indigenous community that's been in some places massacred by this other community, Mm -hmm. and now you're relying on them for care and they Mm -hmm. hold the power, right? And in the Hawaii example, there's power in colonialism, militarism that the U.S. helped um, I'll say the U.S. took away the autonomy of an island. And in that interaction that we're talking about, none of these things are explicitly said, right? Nobody's bringing all these concepts in. Sometimes maybe if you're bold and you're going into that uh, conversation, maybe you bring it up with the patient, but it's in the background and it's in the interaction. So when you talk about, I just went to vacation Hawaii, you're bringing up tourism, how land displacement, the history of losing autonomy to a foreigner Mm -hmm. and now relying on them Mm -hmm. for care and being in their community and not being fully accepted. All of those things are in that definition of cultural safety. So you may ask like, so what do I do? Like seems so big. And I always think about that too. Like thinking about all these things seems overwhelming. But as you said, Keith, I think you said that um, very nicely in that the first step is just awareness because then you can build off that awareness to ensure that you're asking the right questions you're respecting the relationship and honoring the the power differential and acknowledging it and making sure that you're able to bridge it in a way that's conducive to a healing relationship. So for that Hawaii example, you lead with questions rather than say, I went to Hawaii, and I went to vacation in Hawaii, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, that's really helpful. And when we come back from the break, I want to talk more about medical practice and you know how to bring this into our practices and nursing practice as well and maybe some takeaways you might have that you know simple things people can do along these lines of creating cultural safety and being you know culturally humble and creating this sense that people are safe and that their you know their their colonizers aren't going to you know be telling them what to do, for instance, or what to do with their bodies, or whether their their folk ways or mores are wrong or right. So there's a lot more to dig into, and I really appreciate this conversation. And we're going to come right back for the second half of episode 412 with more with Raj Sundar of the Healthcare for Humans podcast. Stay right with us, and we'll be right back. Hey everyone, let's take a quick pause for the cause, shall we? I can't believe we have over 400 episodes of the podcast now, and that's over 400 good reasons to become a patron. If you find value in the Nurse Keith Show, please consider becoming a patron of the podcast at Patreon. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash Nurse Keith. You can always listen for free, of course, but if you'd like to pledge as little as $2 a month, That would be an awesome way to help me cover the costs of producing the show and show your support. 
And if you can pledge more, you'll receive some cool prizes and premiums as my gift to you. If you'd like to do me the honor of becoming a patron, again, head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith. I'd appreciate it so very much. Now, let's get back to today's conversation. And welcome back to the second half of the episode. We're here again with friend of the pod and my new friend and colleague, Raj Sundar. He is a family physician, a community organizer, and the host of the awesome Healthcare for Humans podcast. And Raj, prior to the break, we were talking about cultural humility, cultural safety. And my friends, Camille and Jasmine over at the Distrust and Disparities podcast, and they are two Black women who talk about the disparities that have led to massive distrust on the part of the African-American community when it comes to medicine and science. And she goes back to, or they go back to Tuskegee, Henrietta Lacks, and so many other stories that have caused this distrust to become part of the fabric of how some Black people actually view the scientific world and the medical world for good reason. So on your podcast, you talk about Cambodians and the Khmer Rouge and what, how many Cambodians were slaughtered and the prevalence of mental illness and post-traumatic stress disorder, and also the the reluctance on the part of a lot of Cambodian people to get labeled with those sorts of diagnoses. So my takeaway from several of your episodes, especially the one about the Chinese community and the Cambodian community, is that if we don't understand this history, how can we possibly understand how to approach this 85-year-old man who has new onset whatever, and we're supposed to get him to trust us and take the medication we prescribe. So am I couching that in the right frame in terms of what can engender distrust and what can turn that around? Yeah, I agree with you. And I I was just listening to your episode um, on healing racism. Sorry, I forgot the Mm -hmm. speaker. But they do talk about just how we need to understand our history. The community's history, I think specifically about the history of uh, racism in the U.S., because that's going to help us understand where we are now, and that's the only way we can envision a different future. As you noted, that's why the history is so important. And you brought up the Cambodian community, right? And sometimes it's it's these things are so large, so traumatic, and community has gone through it. And if you ask me, what should we do? I don't I don't have a good answer. But when I talked to one of the, Jennifer Huang, who was in the second episode, she's like, I've been living this for so long. And what we really need is a community space. And we don't have that. Mm. Everybody else do. And that's the one thing I feel like everybody would need right this moment. So if you're listening to that now, like the community is telling you what they need. And if you have power and we all do different levels, right? Some people have power to actually allocate resources. Ideally, mm-hmm. we could kind of create a vision together of what it means to care for that community with people who have that power. But even if you don't have power to reallocate complete, like completely all the resources, you can be a better advocate, right? Now you know in the community, in policies, like, hey, like this is one thing I know that community needs. And I'm going to keep elevating that idea, intervention in the circles that I'm in, out there in the community. If somebody asks me, hey, like, what's a good idea? What should we be doing? I know exactly what to say, right? And Mm -hmm. that kind of Mm -hmm. clarity also can come if you're able to engage directly with the community in that way. Yeah, that clarity is so important. And the, the listening is so important. And on one of your episodes, you talked about history taking. And you mentioned how, you know, as a physician... I take histories. It's what I do. And usually it's the history of the disease or the injury or 
whatever else is the presenting situation, right? And then you're moving towards your differential diagnosis and then your actual diagnosis and treatment. And on that episode, you talked about how there's different types of histories. And you talked about a patient, I believe, who'd had a fall and they'd gone to a birthday party, I think. And I think yeah. they may have been elderly. Yep. And you were, I think you were talking as if you were a clinician who was like, you know, why should I even ask about how important that party was or why they went to the party or why they're so upset that they fell at the party? And, yeah. you know, what does that have to do with me, you know, sending them to orthopedics and, you know, whatever. So you, I love how you tied that history taking into, you know, history. You know, there's this, there's this connection. So how, how do we as clinicians then bring in this sense of that we're interested, you know, and going back to what we talked about in the first half, when we only have nine more minutes, you know, what are the little tricks? Like, what are the little, little hacks you've, you've realized are the things that can just be that little thing that, that can turn the corner with your patient? Yeah, I think it starts from the beginning, right? Anywhere from the introduction to rapport that we just talked about an example with the Hawaii population, but I'll say the other, maybe I'll reframe this, right? Because we're kind of sticking to this 15 minute time frame. But I want to expand the time we have with each other as patient and clinician into either like if you're in the hospital, multiple days, or Mm -hmm. if you're in clinic, multiple visits, possibly in the future. So Mm -hmm. there's short intervals over time. Mm. And I bring that up because let's say I am counseling about food for the Ethiopian population. And I just had somebody who was diagnosed with diabetes. So the ways to appro- there's a way to approach it. See, there's 15 minutes. You know, I can't talk too much about the nuances of diet. I'm going to tell you about this diabetes, and then I'm going to tell you to do the med- like change your diet to the Mediterranean or diet a dash diet. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of evidence for this, and here's a paper, right? Like, and go ahead and read it and see if you can incorporate the diet. It's very likely either I don't see them again, <laughs> or I see them again and I ask them. And either because of the power differential, they say, yeah, yeah, I did that. Yeah, and it's going okay. It's kind of because they don't want to disappoint me. That happens because I'm deciding things for them. Or they say, well, like, I don't really understand it. So now we're kind of back actually in step one because we didn't, we didn't make any progress compared to if I knew a little bit about the Ethiopian diet. And I'm not expecting people to know like tons of information that a nutritionist should, but I know about TEF. I know about injera. I know injera is mostly made of TEF. I know mm. people in the community, because TEF is a little um, expensive, they use white flour. And, yeah. and injera is the spongy bread that Ethiopians use to, to eat mm-hmm. their food with yep. instead of utensils. Yeah. Right. See, now I know this stuff yeah. so well, I'm not even explaining it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> so, but it's a different question if I say, hey, like, you know, your authentic home food is probably okay to eat with your new diagnosis. But I know some people use white flour in their injera and eat that a lot. Are you doing that? Is it possible to substitute that with maybe bulgur or whole wheat? Right? That's it. That's the extent of my counseling. And then the next time I see them, there's a higher probability they actually did that. And over Mm -hmm. the span of our relationship, I actually save time talking about certain things because Mm. we're on the same page and we are working on something together rather than me giving a recommendation and just putting it on them to figure it out, right? That makes a lot of sense. So, you know, of course, in the ED, you're patching people up and you don't have a lot of time and you're just dealing with the presenting issue. So, of course, there's only so much you can do in the ER and you'll probably never see them again. Yeah. Although I I want to add, I mean, even in the ER, Because you're looking for moments of connection still, if not for the patient, for yourself. Because Mm -hmm. what is the antidote for burnout, Keith? Like, I don't know what it is. It's like so complex. A lot of it's systemic. But at the end of the day, it's the connections we have with our patients and our colleagues. And I think Mm -hmm. both of those seem different, even when you're in the ER and you understand Mm -hmm. people's history, right? Like you see a Cambodian woman come in for body pain that could have had primary care visit, but came in because it got so bad. 
there's a different set of skills that you have and an authenticity to the empathy that you have that maybe you can connect with them in a different way. I don't know. I have not That's been in that point. situation, but I'm just yeah. hypothesizing, you know. That's a good point. I'm sure there are some people who work in emergency medicine who are very skilled at that. Yeah. And I'm sure there are some who are very unskilled at that, just like family medicine. Yeah. And you know, I used to work in the Puerto Rican community in Western Massachusetts and Springfield and Holyoke, those two cities. And I worked mostly bilingual positions. And I was I as a person who worked in a federally qualified health center and did outreach and I worked on the street. You know, I had a certain amount of street cred and you know, I visited people in their homes and they fed me and you know invited me to their weddings. So I had that wonderful experience in Massachusetts of being welcomed into the Puerto Rican community, really beginning to understand the community. And it took, you know, a decade for me to get to this place. But but I, as a clinician, I got to cut my teeth in that particular type of environment. And it was very satisfying because of that level of acceptance I I earned. And I really I emphasize the word earned because I put in the years and the long-term relationships. So there is a lot to say for that that repetitiveness of seeing one another over and over again and maybe learning from mistakes too. And I'm sure I made some along the way, right? Uh, part of my humility was realizing when I'd messed up. Yeah. And I'm curious from you, um, where did you grow up? So I grew up in India, in a small mm -hmm. village called Tamarankote. Small for India. There's still thousands of people there. But yeah. uh, thatched huts, cows, chickens, right? At least my early part of years. Um, and then my grandparents, who I was living with, moved to a bigger city called Chennai, which is a mm -hmm. large, large metropolitan city in India, in southern India. Mm. Yeah. And then... When, how old were you when you came to the States then? I was, so my parents had left India, then went to the UK and then the US, because at that time there was this, come out in the, comes out in the Indian episode too, of this just optimism of leaving country and what US being really welcoming to immigrants mm. because they really needed the labor. So my parents left, I stayed with my grandparents, and then I came to the US to join them when I was eight years old or so. Well, I didn't, actually, yeah. I'll say, I didn't know I was going to join them. I came by myself. Imagine an eight-year-old hopping on a Lufthansa flight, and they put this yellow badge on me so some random stranger could point me to the right place. Right. And right. then I came to the U.S., and then I realized I was going to stay because the you don't need to go into the backstory, but right. then I was in the U.S. <laughs> wow. Okay. And I'm curious, you know, growing up, did you, were there things you witnessed as a child and then a teenager and then a young adult, or maybe your parents experienced that one led to you wanting to be a physician and also showed you what difference really meant and what it, what it looked like to maybe not be like everybody else and be treated differently? Did you have like some crystallizing formative experiences that, you know, helped shape this person you are now, it's especially as a clinician? Yeah, yeah. There's probably so many ways I can answer that question. But I will say, I yeah. think it's important, Keith, for you to know, and people who are listening, that I had an arranged marriage with medicine because medicine was a family trade. My dad, my mom, my aunt, my uncle, my cousins, they're all doctors. And the reason was my grandfather grew up in poverty and he felt like this was the only way out. So he made his sons and my mom, who my grandparents were friends, get the, get, got him up real early at 5 a.m. to study every day to make sure they got into medical school, right? And there was this sense of achievement and ambition because they were growing up in poverty and my grandfather saw this was the only way out. But then I came to the U.S., and I was living a life of privilege, but I was still holding on to the values of achievement and ambition. Mm. And I think a lot of people's story are similar, especially when you get into this 
pathway, I'll say, of test taking and getting into the right school, getting to the next right school, getting into the right specialty. <laughs> you mm-hmm. start chasing things. But for me, and I, others feel it too, I think this just sense of emptiness. Because every time you achieve that one thing, I got into my medical school, I got into the residency. The next day, it's always like, now what? Like, what's mm-hmm. next? And I think that moment, those moments have been really painful for me because I wanted mm. a purpose and an impact that was bigger than myself. And I, I won't go into too much of my spiritual journey. You know, I grew up in a Hindu household. I attend church, but I meditate and I've done those 10-day meditation retreats where you're just silent. Vipassana, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know Vipassana, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think coming out of building out of those experiences, I, I knew I, I was a doctor, right? I've chosen this trade. For now, I felt like it was rewarding enough, but I could be a different kind of doctor. Like it didn't all have to be about me, like maximizing my wealth, taking care of my family, but I could really be the one that is focusing on caring for this person in front of me and advocating for bigger systemic changes too, because I had some skills, some resources that I had built up, and that could be my purpose in helping others in a bigger way or in a very individual way and just thinking about what that means to heal. Mm. I think that's the question that I've been trying to ask for myself, Keith. I don't, I'm still on that journey. This podcast was like, I think a iteration of this, right? Trying to figure it out for myself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think to being, being an immigrant yourself, having come here as a child and your parents being immigrants and the immigrant journey and, and, what it what it means to be a person of color in the United States in the 21st yeah. century and well back then it was the 20th century and trying to figure out your place and exactly yeah now now you're a representative of the larger healthcare system right mm-hmm. um and you're also an immigrant so you have this background so you have this this very multifaceted complex history yeah. that is very different than say you know someone who grew up in you know Iowa and went to nursing school and it's a very different experience of this entire trajectory of your life and career yeah and so, i want to acknowledge that everybody brings different experiences right sure but i sure. think we we don't we kind of try to erase that part of our identity or experience to fit into this bigger system and you just jogged a memory for me, Keith, because that was such a good reflection of like mm-hmm. me, eight-year-old Raj coming to America. I went to a Catholic school. I grew up in a Hindu household. We went to temples. But here I went to a Catholic school. That was my first school. And I was like, wow, all Americans go to Catholic school. They must be very religious, right? You're an eight-year-old trying to make sense of this new world. And every Friday I had to go to mass. And there's this openness that you learn because you are young in a new place and your whole world has changed dramatically all of a sudden for me. So that openness, I feel like I've held on to of listening to people and understanding the things around me and paying attention. But as you said, like there's also experiences that made me feel like an outsider. And as an Indian American, like, you know, I'm in many places overrepresented, including in medicine, right? Mm -hmm. But growing up being a dark-skinned Indian, there was some colorism in that I didn't even fit in with my Indian community because I was darker from South India, where a lot of people were North Indians. Mm -hmm. So that sense of outsiderness. And then some people can, acknowledging that people who are dark-skinned and Black folks in this country have dealt with the burnt of racism is when people thought I was Black, right? Pulling me over uh, to search my car, right? Mm. Things that were small incidences that we call microaggressions, but explicitly characterizing me as somewhat of a danger because I looked darker and could look black. Yes. Right. So that I have that complexity too. Again, I can't, like my, all, my entire experience is not being black in America. And I don't want to say that, but I want to acknowledge I can, I, can, I imagine how, how it must have been to live in a body that's being explicitly targeted like that all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, even though I only got small snippets because I was, in a, I was a dark person in a club or my car was getting pulled over. Um, 
And then there's racism that builds. Again, this is another layer of racism builds within your community, within the Indian community, because you want to, my parents will always want to distance ourselves from people who are being marginalized or being oppressed, right? Hey, Hey, like, don't wear those clothes that may look, make you look too black, right? Mm -hmm. Because we want to kind of stay silent in the background where we see systems actively punishing people who look a certain way. Right. Gosh, there's so many, there's layers upon layers upon layers. And, and I think it's so important what you're doing with your podcast and your medical practice, obviously, in Seattle. But your podcast is, you know, you're slowly unraveling or peeling this onion of culture. And I look forward to what this journey is going to be, how it's going to unfold as the podcast grows and and evolves over time. And I'm sure you have all sorts of ideas and visions for what it might look like. And, you know, I can't recommend highly enough that people tune in and listen to Healthcare for Humans. And, you know, that'll be in the show notes, of course, the website and it's it's on all the apps and all the places where people can find podcasts. But before we go, I have four lightning questions I ask all my guests. Are you game for a little lightning round? I'm game. Yeah? Okay. Let's go. <laughs> so the first one is, how do you define success personally or professionally? Success to me feels like reaching a place of contentment which means that I actually start with a place of intention because I don't know when it feels successful to me. So I don't fall into the traps of what other people are telling me, right? Mm, nice. I like that. <laughs> Second question. Could you name or just describe a person who's inspired you in the course of your life? They can be living or dead, famous or not famous at all. Yeah. I think about my grandmother who. Mm -hmm past in the last few years but she got married when she was 13 and was lived in the village and a lot of my formative childhood memories was with her where she didn't really have the autonomy but every day you know her whole day was she woke up she cooked fresh from every single ingredient like getting the coconut shredding the coconut and making the coconut milk and making like the special indian food and then we would eat, and then she would clean up and start cooking the next meal. Wow. <laughs> and then she would, so the only break she would get was at like 6 or 7 p.m. where she would watch a show and then get ready for the next day. So the idea of how just selflessly she gave to the family, and I felt like at least traditionally in Indian society, we didn't acknowledge her and honor everything she's done um, all her life. I think we got better as we got older. But I think it's something you take granted for. You take it. You take for granted. Mm. Yes, a number of guests have brought up grandmothers, especially grandmothers hold a special place in a lot of people's hearts. Yeah, and, it's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm sure she was making traditional South Indian food, right? Yeah, awesome. Dos dosas and idlis yep. and all that. Yeah. All, oh my gosh. Yeah, You're making me happy. You're listing off all my foods. <laughs> Yay! Awesome. Okay. Okay. So the penultimate question. Is there a book or a movie? It doesn't have to be an absolute favorite, but just one book or movie that's had an impact on the way you think or the way you live your life. I'm thinking about this book that I read a while ago that's come to my mind recently called Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. And it's by an uh, Indigenous person in Australia, I believe. I listened to an audiobook, Australian accent. I can remember this. Hmm. But I really liked the, the book because it was so good at expanding our thinking from this reduction that we can do to Indigenous communities. Like, oh, Indigenous communities, what they have to offer us are these like herbs and these alternative ways of healing. But it's hmm. actually a perspective of the world that we're missing, the interconnectedness. An example that stuck with me from that book was um, about fish oil. He said, you know, there's some research done that says fish oil sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. But he said, but like, you know what I really want to know, like, where was the salmon caught? Like, what was the location? What season was it? How was the salmon treated? And he said, there's a reason we have lived off salmon for so long and it's healed us. It's because we make sure we only eat it during certain times of year and we treat it with respect. And there's so many things going into that relationship more than 
extracting fish oil to <laughs> to treat a medical illness, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think about that example of how expansive that interconnectedness is. Mm. And the name of the book is Sand Talk? Uh Uh-huh. Sand Talk. Sand Talk. Okay. Awesome. All right. Okay. Last question. So if you, Raj, were elected king of the world, what's one of the first things you would want to do to improve the lives of your subjects? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) I would go, so the the great thing about that question, Keith, is Mm -hmm. I can assume I can do anything I want, but I don't have to feel bad about destroying things. (laughs) We should just destroy our healthcare system, right? Start from the ground up on things that actually help people's health. Like we give people housing. We make sure they get access to good, nutritious food. We make sure that we build communities that have social connections. So we're not overworking them. We give them time. And I'll keep building on those things and then think about a healthcare system. I feel like the places I hit the wall the hardest is there's so many entrenched interests in healthcare. You Mm -hmm. say somebody's cost is another person's profit. That yes, right. Like so. So King King Raj would start with dismantling the entire healthcare system. Awesome. I love it. Yes. <laughs> My inner <I> anarchist <laughs> loves that. <laughs> That's great. I had to say it. I told you, you got me all excited. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Well, Raj, this has been so delightful. And your podcast is amazing, Healthcare for Humans. And I'm so, so, so glad you reached out to me. And I can't wait to meet in person someday. And you are an amazing human being doing great work in the world. And I I appreciate you so much. Thanks so much for those kind words, Keith. Thanks for having me today. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this awesome episode of the Nurse Keith Show. Remember, you can look at the show notes on any app where you're listening or over at nursekeith.com. And please check out Healthcare for Humans. I hope you've uplifted, empowered, and informed from this episode. And I encourage you to take inspired action every day in the interest of your personal, professional growth, satisfaction, and development. If you need personalized, holistic career coaching, look no further than nursekeith.com. Mention the show, get 10% off your first coaching package. And if you want to become a patron at Patreon, or you want to leave a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google, I will kiss your feet in gratitude. And remember, rrenegade.pro, log into the portal, select me or any other content creator and get some CEUs for listening to podcasts because you're listening anyway. We're proud members of the Health Podcast Network where you can find some of the greatest podcasts related to health, healthcare, and medicine and nursing at healthpodcastnetwork.com. We're produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting and Mark Cappiespeason is our stalwart social media ringmaster and newsletter wrangler. Before we say goodbye, I'll leave you with this quote by the musician Robert Fripp. May my living honor my parents and may my living repay the debt of my existence. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful and super cold Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Raj Sundar saying Arrivederci from? From a beautiful, rainy Seattle, Washington. All right. Thank you, Raj. Thanks to everyone for listening. And we will catch you on the proverbial flip side. <laughs>